Just before we get started with today's video, I will say that it's brought to you by Beardblaze. Some of you may have heard this before, but I've got another channel called Brainblaze, and that channel actually led to the development of this very product. Long story short, I made a joke on that channel about how all YouTubers have beauty lines, and a fan of that channel actually emailed me saying, Simon, don't start a beauty line, but look at that magnificent beard of yours. Why don't you make your own range of beard oils? And I was like, well, I already use beard oil. So that seems like a great fit. Beard oil, by the way, you put it in your beard, it makes it all soft and nice. It keeps those errand hairs in. Just all about having a healthier beard. Beard Blaze makes a full, luscious beard a reality, solving all of life's problems with fine facial hair, not a guarantee. So Will, the fan of that channel, he sent me a bunch of samples which I rubbed into my beard like some sort of guinea pig. I chose the best ones and we put them out as a whole range of beard oils. You can buy them in good sized bottles like this because I always found that beard oil came in tiny, super expensive bottles. That's not what we do. Or if you're not sure which one's right for you, we've got a whole sample pack. But it's not just beard oils, we've expanded to shampoos and conditioners and moisturizers, all sorts of cool stuff. Beardblaze.com is where you go. And now today's video. Located on the outskirts of the Turkish capital of Ankara, the opulent White Palace Aksaray, or Chankaya Presidential Mansion, has been President Erdogan's resident seat of power and personal paradise since winning the 2014 election. Though the mansion originally served as the official home of the country's prime minister, shortly after being sworn in, Erdogan claimed it as his own, though he's constantly reminding everyone that it technically belongs to all Turks, which, in case you were wondering, means that it doesn't. Alternately described as gaudy, majestic, ostentatious, and downright ugly, the residence is a hodgepodge of motifs, materials, and architectural elements that make it unique, if not altogether aesthetically pleasing. Featuring more than a thousand rooms spread across an idyllic two plus million square feet, the complex is approximately 50 times larger than America's White House, and its location on scenic lands that was once part of the historic Ataturk forest farm has made it even more controversial than it would have been otherwise. The brainchild of the brazen, patriotic, and allegedly other things leader, Erdogan and his cronies see his colossal structure as a key element in what they commonly refer to as the New Turkey. According to this thinking, the country and its lead have every right to take their spots on the world stage, regardless of the cost. On the other hand, detractors see this vision as little more than a strong man's attempt at inflating his own ego and solidifying his power base, while living like a Saudi sheik at the expense of his nation. Purportedly costing more than a billion US dollars, approximately twice as much as the original estimates, just months after construction was complete, the country's finance minister grudgingly admitted that an additional hundred million dollars had been earmarked for general maintenance and additional refinements. Even as early as December 2014, amidst an ever-increasing cry for transparency, Turkey's Housing and Development Authority refused to divulge official construction cost figures on the grounds that making them public could harm the economy. To put things in perspective, Turkey's GDP was approximately 720 billion US dollars in 2020. Perhaps Erdogan and the Turkish government worry that animosity and resentment might spread if everyone found out how much the house cost. After all, the country's average annual household income hovers around $3,000. To add fuel to the already growing fire in recent years, fallout from the COVID-19 pandemic has caused a significant increase in poverty, pushed inflation to a multi-year high of nearly 18%, and resulted in a huge jump in energy costs, in some cases by nearly 15%. All told, Erdogan's big project is looking more and more like a political albatross. It's easy to blame Erdogan for excessive spending and lavishing himself and his family in unimaginable luxury, but it may not have been possible if the presidential residence and compound weren't already there when he took office. Though less regal and expansive than they are now, both were constructed nearly a century ago under the reign of renowned revolutionary field marshal, statesman, and founding father of the Republic of Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who served as the country's first president until his death in 1938. With the signing of the Treaty of Lisan in the summer of 1920, after a particularly heinous and atrocity-filled three-year war with Greece, Ankara became the capital of the new Turkish state. Also a progressive reformer and ardent nationalist, Ataturk is credited with transforming the relatively fractured Muslim kingdom into a modern, secular, industrial nation through ideals, programs, and policies collectively known as Kemalism. 
But ironically, though he was fiercely independent and rightfully wary of foreign meddling, he did like his creature comforts, and as such, the original Chankaya mansion incorporated both traditional Turkish art and architecture, as well as Western amenities that made life more comfortable. To ensure that no detail was overlooked, Ataturk hired famous Austrian architect Dr. Clemens Hallmeister, and many of the mansion's interior spaces were designed at Vienna's Academy of Fine Arts. The original plans were delivered to Ataturk in the summer of 1930, and construction got underway in early 1931. Though largely overseen by foreigners, most of the work was carried out by thousands of local artisans, masons, craftsmen, carpenters, and laborers, and by June of 1932, the project was complete. The vast presidential compound consists of multiple buildings that include ritzy hotel-style rooms, blast-proof bunkers, state-of-the-art communications centers, and posh indoor swimming pools, as well as a private lakeside beach, all of which are recent additions that were authorized by Erdogan. In all its splendor, the presidential palace is the compound's main feature, and it's where Erdogan spends much of his work and leisure time. Though it's probably just a guess, the palace's room count may be as high as 1,150, and by some counts, at least 250 of them are reserved exclusively for Erdogan and his family. Though some are used by high-ranking domestic and international visitors, even at its busiest, there may be as many as 800 or 900 rooms that remain perpetually unoccupied, which begs the question, why were so many built and why are they so richly appointed? Like pretty much everything else inside the presidential compound, the specifics of the C-41 bunker are hazy at best, but it's rumored to be as secure and technologically advanced as anything in the West, and why wouldn't it be considering the price tag? It's from this immense bunker that surveillance drones are controlled, news from the provinces is monitored, and the Turkish armed forces are commanded, all with help from at least two supercomputers that store and manage huge amounts of data around the clock. But though the subterranean facility's main goal purportedly includes aiding the country's defense and managing disaster relief efforts, detractors claim that it's really all about keeping a watchful eye on political opponents, stifling dissent, and protecting the leader from chemical, biological, and nuclear attacks, all of which they consider pretty unlikely. Another criticism often put towards Erdogan is that he's overseeing Turkey's transition from a secular state to a Muslim one, and the Bestetmel Mosque is largely to blame for that. At one time, Erdogan even proposed calling the new presidential complex an impossible to renounce Turkish term, which is loosely translated into a compound centered around a mosque, which is exactly what it actually is. This creeping re Islamification could threaten to reopen long dormant domestic hostilities, as well as increase tensions between Turkey and the West, which haven't always been great to begin with. With. Featuring stunning classic Turkish and Ottoman architectural elements, the Bistet Millet Mosque has four crescent topped minarets, each of which stretches nearly 200 feet. 61 meters skyward. The mosque was opened in early July of 2015, but though it spread over nearly 56,000 square feet, that's 5,180 square meters, and is capable of accommodating between 3,000 and 4,000 worshippers, it's essentially off limits to everyone but Erdogan, his family, and his most ardent supporters. With more than 4 million historic and contemporary books written in over 130 languages, the Presidential Library is the country's largest book repository, and it's still growing, because in collaboration with the Foreign Ministry, it regularly receives new material from each country in which Turkey has an embassy or consulate. One of the library's centerpieces is the Diwan Lugat al-Turk, the first comprehensive dictionary of Turkic languages that was compiled in the 11th century AD. Officially opened by Erdogan in late February of 2020, such a library might seem like a wise use of resources in a country of 84 million, where according to multiple sources, the literacy rate is over 90%. By comparison, according to the National Center for Educational Statistics, America's literacy rate was less than 80% in 2019. That said, other than a few awkwardly staged events featuring wide-eyed local school children, chances are that few, if any, average Turks will ever have the opportunity to read a single sentence from a book in the presidential library.
Though plagued by both domestic and international controversy, a number of notable leaders and heads of state have made appearances at the palace over the years, the first of which was Pope Francis, who visited in late November 2014. The powerful and vocal union of Chambers of Turkish Engineers and Architects, UCTEA, officially urged the Pope to cancel a visit on the grounds that the construction was unlicensed and therefore illegal. Apparently unconcerned over the palace's legality, the head of the Catholic Church stopped by anyway, and just a month later, Russian President Vladimir Putin was the second foreign dignitary welcomes with a lavish ceremony staged in front of the new palace. Though chock full of firm handshakes, broad grins, and promises of increased economic and cultural collaboration, the two leaders may have called the whole thing off had they known that a year later tensions between the two countries would reach epic proportions when a Turkish F-16 shot down a Russian Sukhoi Su-24 on the Syrian border. Nonetheless, the guests continued to roll in, and in mid-January of the following year, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas visited. It was during this photo op that Erdogan was lambasted for being flanked by members of the presidential guard who were clad in gaudy and historically inaccurate military garb that to some looked a lot like pajamas. The most vocal and outspoken critic of this embarrassing blunder was a dean of a local medical school who just wouldn't let the issue die. After a bevy of pointed and insulting tweets, he was forced to resign his position after receiving numerous threats and being hounded by youth protesters from the local Justice and Development, or AK Party, which is a conservative political organization founded by Erdogan before he was elected president. The aforementioned Ataturk forest farm was established by Mustafa Kemal Ataturk in 1925 on land that was later officially declared protected, which meant that construction and development was strictly forbidden. Fast forward 90 years, however, and well, you know what happened. Even before construction began, when the details of Erdogan's project came to light, they caused furors in political, social, and professional circles, and among the loudest opponents was the UCTEA. At their prompting in late 2014, an Ankarian court ordered a halt to construction, and their ruling was supported by the Council of State, which found that the development clearly violated the law. Not one to take criticism lying down, Erdogan apparently quipped, let them tear it down if they can. He went on to say that nobody had the power to stop him and the construction would continue at breakneck pace and that he'd be moving in as planned. Meanwhile, those who opposed the idea scratched their heads wondering what could be done, which turned out to be very little because construction continued unabated. Erdogan's palace is often likened to Romania's Ceausescu's People's Palace because of its aloof opulence and staggering cost, and as you probably guessed, the construction process was rife with waste and abuse. And here are some interesting wasteful facts about the presidential palace. There are more than 60 elevators on the grounds. At nearly a quarter of a million US dollars, the monthly energy bill is roughly the equivalent of the salaries of a thousand Turkish workers. The UCTA claims that the window glass alone costs nearly $80 million. Bedrooms, bathrooms, pools, saunas, spas, and formal living rooms are appointed with European marble, much of which costs nearly $350 per square foot. Everyday drinking glasses cost nearly $100 each, thanks to their pure gold trim and inlays. And we could go on, but why bother? Whatever you think about this building, whether it's wonderful or wasteful, one thing is for certain. It's an impressive construction. So I really hope you found this video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe, and thank you for watching.